welcome to Inside Healthcare. This program marks our 15th year for Inside Healthcare. We have done nearly 200 shows, interviewed several hundred guests, including top doctors, healthcare professionals, and patients. We've met fascinating and courageous people who have shared their incredible stories with us. And we begin this new year and a new decade with another great program to talk about the latest of this year's flu, your risk for diabetes, and what you can do to keep your eyes healthy in the new year. We begin by talking with an urgency room doctor about the flu. We're inside the urgency room in Egan talking with Dr. Brian Jones about the flu. The health department says that there have been over 500 people hospitalized in Minnesota with the flu this season, as well as there have been several deaths reported. So thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me. So what are you seeing here at the urgency room? Tell us a little bit more about the, the flu that you're seeing. So uh, it's been a very busy flu season, probably busier than we've seen in a couple of years. Um, it's been a strange flu season in that we're seeing more influenza B, which we usually don't see till much later, uh, and less A. Um, uh, but otherwise it looks like the flu. It's a lot of cough and fever and body aches. And does this, and is it more severe than, as blue more, is the, the virus um, B, is that more severe than A? No, I always thought A could be more severe. Uh, e the both can be of equal severity. B tends to have more uh, gastrointestinal symptoms with it, like nausea and vomiting, although oh. this year's B seems to have a little less of that. But and what are the common symptoms that you're seeing along with yeah. this flu? Uh, generally, you're going to see high fevers, often up to 103, 104, uh, usually cough, uh, mostly non-productive. Uh, body aches are usually a commonality between both both types. And are there a certain population that are being more affected by it? Or I know obviously there's the high risk group, but. Yeah, uh, we're seeing it pretty much across all populations. Uh, very young children and the elderly are at the most risk uh, for complications from that. Or anybody who has uh, immune compromise like diabetes, people with respiratory problems like asthma or emphysema or on chemotherapy drugs if they have cancer. So what would be the best way to treat this at home or obviously yeah. try to stay home and, and stay away from right. other people. Yeah, in general, it's mostly supportive care. It's going to be uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen to help control the fevers uh, and the body aches. Make sure you're staying well hydrated. Uh, try to uh, observe good hygiene. Wash your hands, cover your cough. You know, don't go to work if you can't, if you don't have to, because then you're more likely to spread it. Get immunized, because the flu vaccine does seem to be making a difference. So it's not too late to get the flu vaccine. No, absolutely saying. not. It, it's still relatively early in the flu season. I don't anticipate this is going away soon. So if you haven't gotten it, I would recommend getting it at this time. And does this seem like the, it's peaked already, or is it still widespread, like the so, health department has said? Oh, it's still, yeah, still very widespread. Yeah, I haven't seen much of a slowdown, and we haven't, like I said, we haven't seen much of the influenza A, and I anticipate that, that that'll, that, that'll come in at some point. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty soon. So, and then um, when should someone come to the urgency room or seek emergency care sure. with their flu symptoms? Yeah, it, uh, those people that are at increased risk should probably come in sooner rather than later, uh, especially if they're having any respiratory difficulty, difficulty breathing. People who are unable to maintain uh, their fluid intake and stay hydrated, uh, we can help out with either IV fluids or things to help them from uh, vomiting and uh, uh, getting dehydrated. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anybody who feels like this is something more than the flu, especially if they get it and then get better and then all of a sudden get worse, you can get a post-influenza pneumonia that we are concerned about It sometimes. seems like I've been hearing that from other people saying that they thought they just had the flu and now they've been diagnosed with pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So yeah, something to be concerned about. So any type of thing like that, they should come here and, and or they can go see their doctors. Absolutely, right? yeah. We can certainly help them out here at the urgency room. We can put in IVs and give fluids. We can do chest x-rays, make sure they don't have pneumonia uh, and look for any other serious complications. Any other tips on how people can prevent getting it at this late stage yeah. and stuff besides the vaccine? Yeah. Uh, how good, they can yeah. protect their family? Yeah, good, good hygiene. Stay away from the large gatherings where there might be the flu involved. If you're so inclined, wear a mask. Make sure you're covering your own cough. Wash your hands frequently. Uh, don't drink from other people's glasses, that type of thing. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of people wearing masks ask, yeah. ask all over the place. So um, final advice for people you know, on the flu and how to yeah. protect them and their family? Yeah. Um, get vaccinated. Uh, uh, stay out of those situations where you're going to be around people that are sick. And again, wash your hands and uh, 
avoid people's cough. And for those not familiar with the urgency room, just briefly tell us about the urgency room. Uh, urgency room is a, an acute care destination where we can see anything from a sore throat up to uh, a chest pain, broken bones. Uh, we have both uh, imaging and lab capabilities to, to pretty much take care and diagnose most of those problems. And you have three locations around the Twin Cities? We do. We're located in Egan, Woodbury, and Vadness Heights. Final advice for our viewers about beating the flu this season? Um, get plenty of rest, stay hydrated, and get vaccinated. Well, Dr. Brian Jones, thanks. Good advice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this. I'm always the first one up. I'm always up for a challenge. I'll overcome any obstacle. I don't believe in limits. I refuse to be average. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Diabetes is a serious problem in this country, especially among the Hispanic and Latino community. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that 50% of Hispanic people in the United States will develop diabetes. To discuss this health issue facing Hispanic and Latinos in Minnesota and what can be done to prevent the disease and or to manage it, we're very pleased to have with us Francisco Ramirez and he's with M Health uh, Fairview. So glad well, to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me and for this opportunity to talk about diabetes and what is happening in our communities today. So do we know why Latino, Hispanic are at a higher risk for developing diabetes? Yeah. I mean, that's surprising when I hear 50% may develop it in their lifetime. It's a huge number. And um, well, diabetes is a group of diseases in which sometimes your glucose, that is sugar, builds up in your blood. Then it might be related with genetics, but also it might be related with like healthy lifestyles in the Latino community. And then the, the numbers that we have right now is just like unbelievable to believe, but it's just like about 66% really? of the Latino community in Minnesota are 66% 60, of the Latino community oh in Minnesota are either obese or overweight. And that's a risk factor to develop diabetes type 2. And also, perhaps you were saying before we started the program, lack of exercise could be a, another issue as well, a, or a contributing factor to that? Yeah, and then like we say uh, before, like genetics play a big role in this, but also what you can do to prevent or to decrease your risk is related with healthy lifestyles. And lack of exercise, like then we are like facing this with our communities make uh, play a big role in developing diabetes and also our eating like our eating habit habits also play a big role in developing diabetes. I understand too that a lot of people are not aware that they may even be pre-diabetic or have diabetes. Um, what would be those symptoms? What should people be looking for? And um, the best thing is to get tested, right? To see? Yes, um, that's a big point. And right now, unfortunately, it's just about 10% of the Minnesota population, the people that lives in Minnesota, about 10% who have diabetes. And, and we're talking adult onset or type yes, 2 diabetes. type 2 diabetes. And it's a huge number. And then when we talk about the symptoms that sometimes people can feel or have, varies in different people. But people can have like increased like, like appetite, they have like they say, well, I want to eat all the time, or oh. I want. I'm, they are thirsty all the time, or they go uh, to urinate during the, during the day, like ten times a day, ten times per day, or during the night. They say, well, I cannot sleep because I go to. I have to use the bathroom four or five times during the night. Is that normal? Well, no, it's not normal. <laughs> Sometimes they they lose weight, but without doing a specific diet program or without doing exercise then they, they come to the office and they say I have lost I lose like 20 pounds in the last few weeks is that normal no it's not let's see what's mm -hmm. happening but knowing your numbers is extremely important and talking with your healthcare provider and that's something a simple blood test can help to test that thing. yeah and then we can do like that they can do the a1c test that is a1c is a test 
then you don't have to be fasting, but that will allow you to know how is your glucose in the last three months. Then talking with your provider about that test, A1C is very important. And then also the fasting plasma glucose test that we can do is just like you fast overnight, then you go next day in the morning and you will be able to know how much is your number. And it's so important to detect it early because the big concern is the complications. Yes. If it's not managed, it can cause serious, yeah. serious health com um, complications. Definitely, it's related with other com comorbidities and also with other diseases. Like we can start from here, like a stroke. When you have diabetes, you increase your risk for a stroke. You increase your risk for heart attack. I don't think attack. people make those connections. Yeah. yeah, then you increase your risk for eye damage. You increase your risk for retin uh, nephropathy then you increase your risk for neuropathy. Then there are a lot of other conditions that are related with diabetes when you have it, if you don't have diabetes under control. So prevention is the key, and that is your area of expertise, and that's what you do here in the Twin Cities. Tell us about what are you doing to try to prevent diabetes, and especially in the Latino, Hispanic population. Yeah, we have, I'm glad to be part of this amazing team at Community Advancement with M Health Fairview now. Uh, my team is community engagement, then what I've been doing with our communities is pretty much uh, providing resources and education in regards to prevention. I think we have to spend more time uh, building trust with our communities and providing information because education is so important. And sometimes our communities are so stressed out that they don't have the time or it's so hard for them to take the time to go for a class. Then we try to make connections, go where they are, um, have a conversation about how they can decrease the risk about diabetes or other diseases, but also how can they decrease the risk um, for having diabetes. And what would be, again, you were saying to get at least 30 minutes of exercise in daily and other, what were some of those other things that, how are you reaching in this community about um, prevention? Yeah. And, and then, are they resistant? Are they re receptive to the idea? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, they love having like these classes there. Like when you say we are going to be doing a demo about healthy eating or it's just like they are really, really into like, okay, like, what, what are we are going to cook? Oh, people love eating, yeah, right? People yeah. love eating. I and mean, that's a good start point. But it's like, it's not only like we learn a lot from them too. It's just like not all, not all the time it's just, oh, I'm here. I'm the health educator. I'm going to give you all this information that you need to know. Things don't work like that really well, but even like a simple making that connection and say, okay, let's just read the label. Let's just, see, let's just talk about portions. Let's just talk about what are carbohydrates? What are the starchy vegetables? What are the non-starchy vegetables? The, all that kind of stuff is really important. And from there, they start asking you more questions. So my dad have, has diabetes. What else they can, we can do at home to help him? And then it's just like, okay, if they have that, because they are scared. Sometimes it's like, I hear them people um, start using insulin and then that was the end of the disease. And it's just like, no, actually you need to talk with your provider because like we say, to avoid complications like stroke, heart attack, retinopathy with the eyes problems, nephropathy with the kidneys, or neuropathy with the nerve damage, is very important to have that connection with your family mm -hmm. practice provider. So um, without taking a class, what would be some of those tips that you can share with our viewers on some of the things, reading the labels, what are the, some of the things that they, should, they could start right now, you know, after they watch this interview here? Yeah, well, the first thing is just like, please, if you feel that you need to get more information, and also we offer these classes also in Spanish for the Latino community, it's just like, please uh, don't be shy. There are resources for our communities, and not only for the Latino community, I'm talking about vulnerable communities who are in a higher risk for diabetes or hypertension or other diseases. Please call us. Our community engagement department, we have free resources to help you. Free. And free, and to help the community um, sometimes there are times where there are nurses from Fairview that are doing testing. Sometimes we have classes that mm -hmm. are free, like about healthy eating or living well with diabetes or preventing diabetes. And I think that will be the first step. Don't be shy. 
call us. These classes and services are free for our community. And also, we will be happy to provide you more information. But if I can say three things besides that calling us, then you can start doing is, if you lose weight, you are going to be doing a huge change in your life. You can actually even reverse it, can't you? Yes. And some individuals, I think I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. And then when diabetes is a chronic condition. When, somebody, when they diagnose diabetes, it's not that you are cured. But there are a lot of times that you stop taking medications because you are in a very good control with diet and exercise. But you need to talk with your provider before you stop uh, taking your medication. Always follow the instructions of the provider. And also, if it's losing weight, 5 to 7% of your weight is a huge help. Eating healthy, drink more water, stop drinking soda, please. That's what I told the community all the time. And also physical activity. We have to, this is a winter time, I know, but it's kind of like January and we start with goals. And it's just like, even if you start slow, five, 10 minutes a day, is better than nothing. But the American Diabetes Association recommends like 30 minutes per day, at least five days per week. Well, awesome advice. So if someone wants more information, how should they get a hold of you or how would they contact you? Yes, uh, my number is 651-643-0313. 651-643-0313. And I'll be happy to provide more information. Well, this has been awesome, really. Hopefully we get everyone off to a good start this year and it'll be a really healthy year for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Francisco. Thank you for having me. Uh, we'll be back with more. We're interviewing a local doctor to how to keep your eyes healthy in the new year. So stay with us. Awkward. Do I look familiar? I should. You might remember me from here. Here. We were from here. Or maybe even here. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. It can actually be a perfect moment to reach out to a friend and ask if they're okay if they seem down. It doesn't matter how you say it. You all right? Everything's okay? All G. You all right, girl? Oh, you cool? You bug and dog. Just show you're there for them. Go on, Kelly. See the awkward. Hey, um, you haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. And joining us now is Dr. Mo Duan with the Plastic Eye, Eye Plastic Surgery of Minnesota to talk about keeping your eyes healthy in this new year. And it sounds like after our last guest that we want to start with reducing your risk for diabetes. That's a good start in getting your eyes healthy. But yeah. I'm glad to have you with us. Well, thank you very much, Jody. So, um, I know in the winter time we don't think about protecting, I don't know if people think about protecting their eyes, but they need to be doing that. And why do they need to, and what should they be doing to keep their eyes healthy? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different things that can affect our eyes. And I think here in Minnesota, we often think of winter as sort of an overcast, dreary sort of environment. And the reality is we get a lot of sunlight in our eyes and reflect it onto our face from the snow and the ice and the, the wet roads that we have here in, in the wintertime. And so that can lead to a lot of uh, specific issues with the eyes, both around the eyes in terms of damaging our skin, as well as within the eyes themselves with things like cataract formation. And for patients who have uh, retinal disease can actually make that worse as well. Yeah, I don't think people think of those in those terms either. So what should they be doing to protect them? Yeah, the simplest thing, of course, is wearing uh, UV protected sunglasses. So yeah. uh, wearing them all the time, really year round, is, is what any ophthalmologist would recommend and certainly I would as well. And uh, it makes sense, uh, especially in the winter time, it's just hard to see anyway with that reflected light. So the sunglasses can help you just get around but certainly also protect your eyes um, by uh, filtering out a lot of that ultraviolet light. I was surprised. I was just talking to someone this morning, and he was saying how he had a basal cell right here. He mm -hmm. wore glasses. He was surprised that he would get it, you yeah. know, but it was like right by the corner of the eye. And yeah. So the eyelids, the upper and the lower lids, are actually the second most common place on the face no, to get a skin I cancer. I never knew that. Yeah, after the tip of the nose, uh, which of course is completely exposed. And so uh, wearing sunglasses, sunscreen, hats, 
over the course of the year is, is particularly important. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer and almost all of them are caused by UV sunlight damage that's accumulated over the years and so just protecting yourself at all times makes a big difference. Yeah, there. I think I went skiing one too many times here Yeah, and it's showing on my face these days. So um, what would be some other tips on what people should be doing to protect their eyes in the winter time here especially? Yeah, so um, you know you mentioned things like diabetes and all that. Of course controlling the systemic aspects of your, uh, your uh, bodily health can help improve your eyesight, but from a specific uh, perspective around the eyes, which is what I tend to deal with, the things I think about in addition to the skin cancers would be what I call eyelid malpositions. The most common one is droopy eyelids, of oh, course. Yes. I see that all the time Especially in my practice. Especially aging baby boomers. Yeah. That's exactly right. With age, we see a lot more of that. But the lower lids as well can um, have these malpositions where both uh, turning inward towards the eye and outward from the eye or droopy lower lids can actually irritate the eyes as well. That can lead to things like uh, chronic redness, irritation, discharge, and ultimately affect your vision long term if it goes untreated as well. So getting those things looked at and checked out is always a good idea. So the dripping eyelid is something that you can test at your clinic then as well? That's exactly right. You know when people uh, think of plastic surgery, which is what I do, we always think of cosmetic plastic yeah. surgery. But the, uh, the reality is the majority of plastic surgery is medical in nature, insurance based. It's not cosmetic. And dripping eyelids are the same way. We certainly do uh, a lot of those for cosmetic reasons, uh, addressing droopy eyelids, but a very significant portion of those, particularly in our population as we get older, uh, have their vision being affected by the lids getting lower and droopier over their eyes. Typically peripheral vision, the vision up high or off to the right and left, what we like to refer to as driving vision, gets affected by the lids coming down. It's kind of like oh. a visor or a window shade coming yeah. down over your eyes. And so those are things that we can test for and insurance companies have specific requirements and things that we have to do to prove the medical nature of it. But if we can make that case, then we can uh, certainly address those uh, on a medical basis. And the surgery is one. minimal or? It's yeah, it's an outpatient operation. Uh, depending upon exactly what's going on, it can only take about 30 minutes or so. And many of them we even do in the office setting. You wouldn't necessarily even have to go to a hospital or surgery center to have it addressed. And very little recovery, downtime, just sorts of Tylenol for pain kind of levels. And so. patients awake for it? Or? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much all the surgery we do, People or that go, I do, <laughs> and certainly we're queasy around the eyes. But I think a lot of it is more the anticipation than the procedure. Yeah, and so with you know with, with what I do, almost all of my patients are awake, which makes for a quick, easy recovery keeps patients nice and comfortable during the course of the operation as well. So it works out really, really well for patients. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and talking about around the eye and stuff. I mean, we see a lot of advertisements these days um, about reducing puffiness and mm -hmm. also um, um, dark circles and things like that. What about these, what, what are these creams that they're selling in? And yeah. I would imagine you would probably advise against them. Uh, so most of the creams are addressing things like coloration around the eyes. They may provide a little bit of tightening, at least temporarily, to the skin, and they can make things look a little bit better, but albeit very temporarily. You know, to address dark circles or bags under the eyes, you have to kind of understand exactly what the physiology is here. And really what we're dealing with is how light or shadows are being cast onto the face by other features of our face. In the lower lid itself, what you're dealing with are actually, uh, what I like to describe as kind of a valley, which is the area just underneath the okay. eyelid that attaches to the cheekbone. That's kind of the area we see the dark circle, if you will. And on either side of that, there's a hill. There's the fat or the prominence of the lower lid, and then the prominence of the cheek. So when you have a valley like that, shadows especially if they're coming from up high, which is where all of our lighting comes from in the real world, uh, we see those dark circles become more prominent. So putting a cream or something in that area, you can understand, is not going to do much other than just hide that shadow for a short period of time. Any 
Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say to address that, then you either have to lessen the depth of that valley, and we do that. And with, this is something that you do. That's right. We do that with things such as fillers, or you can actually do some movement of fat within the lower lid, or we reduce those prominences by taking some of the fat out of the lid surgically, and again maybe repositioning that in the valley to give you a smoother transition onto your cheek. So that's uh, an involved surgery, but that's exactly what an eye plastic surgeon such as myself wow. would do. We're going to have to. Uh, shadow you one of these times <laughs> in the OR and, and or in your clinic there and, and show our viewers what we're talking about and the, the results in that. Yeah. So um, and just very quickly final comments about like you've talked about a lot of the things that you do and just tell mm -hmm. us about your practice and stuff. You're yeah. one of the you're one of the few in the Twin Cities and one the only one in the East Metro that I'm aware of. That's exactly right. So eye plastic surgery or ophthalmic plastic surgery is a subspecialty of ophthalmology. So I was originally trained as an eye surgeon and then I did further training in plastic surgery specifically in the areas around the eyes. Now nationwide there's about four to five hundred of us. Uh, most of them concentrate on the coast as you can imagine. Here in the state of Minnesota there's ten total eye plastic surgeons uh, and then I'm the only one as you mentioned in the East Metro really between Minneapolis and Madison, Wisconsin. I'm the only full-time oculoplastic surgeon on that side. So my practice focuses specifically on the areas around the eyes. Again, some of what we've talked about, skin cancers, droopy eyelids, but also things such as trauma and tear drain surgery, which I do oh, a yes. lot of as well. Um, we do that both for cosmetic as well as for uh, reconstructive, reconstructive purposes. So if someone wanted more information mm -hmm. to look into some of the things that you do, um, where would they find that information? Yeah, certainly our website has a lot of information. That's iplasticsmn.com or they can call our office anytime, 651-998-9048. We're always happy to answer questions or see patients. Final comments for our viewers on keeping their eyes healthy this winter. Yeah, we only get one set of eyes, and so if you have any concerns about your vision or you're seeing new lumps and bumps around the eyes, please get them checked out either by myself or your uh, ophthalmologist. Well, doctor, pleasure to have you with us. Great information. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you. And that's our program for you. Thank you for joining us. We'll join you next time on Inside Healthcare. See you then, everyone.